Greetings and welcome to this video. I'm going to be talking about the murder of Sophie Duplantier. I, I apologize if I'm not pronouncing the name correctly. Um, she was a 39 year old French woman killed outside of her holiday home uh, in Cork, Ireland in December of 1996. Um, one who was described as a journalist, uh, Ian Bailey, had been arrested twice for the, the murder. Um, the Irish justice system did not feel there was enough to convict him. Eventually he sued uh, in 2003, some newspapers, he lost those. And then in 2019, he was convicted of murder in absentia in his absence in Paris, of which um, Ireland did not have an agreement with France to extradite him there. And so um, this gives me an opportunity to talk a little bit about a, a few of things that are in more depth than not. And um, I begin with this particular case and address the, um, the work that was done on it. So our team worked on it and I, I don't remember the, the number, but I think it may have been um, 14 or more straight months. And by team, I, I mean uh, analysts from around the world, including uh, in this point, uh, Ireland, England, and France, which would be uh, three countries certainly that we need to check in terms of language, expressions, uh, customs, and that sort of thing. So very helpful. But there was a subset of analysts, like, like a committee, who worked on this diligently behind the scenes uh, for more than a year. Uh, their work was exemplary. They eventually made contact with the family, worked with the family, and, and um, I'm hoping that that will bring some fruit for justice for the family. Um, but I'm going to leave it to them to release some of the details and some of their work. They, they deserve the credit for it. it, it tremendous work and uh, perseverance, um, which brings me to the psycholinguistic profiling that was done. Um, I pulled this out. This is an example of that. This is called The Mind of Adolf Hitler. This was an intelligence report uh, by Walter Langer, an intelligence report where they were to try to get insight into Hitler's personality to predict for war what may happen. And they did a, a terrific job. Remember, they couldn't interview Hitler himself, so they had to rely on collateral interviews, but also upon speeches, transcriptions of speeches. And so by listening to someone's words, we're gaining a lot of insight into the personality, uh, into some of their, and, and including the dominant traits, which allows us to gain understanding into their thinking and what may happen next. It's very difficult work. Um, it's best done and perhaps only done successfully in a team setting. So there's a lot of ideas coming together a lot of questions being thrown at someone. It's not something that can be really taught over a video. Um, there's so much more that goes on that professionals are needed to press against each other with ideas and opinions. What we principally use it for in terms of a, a reaching a pinnacle is able to identify the author of anonymous letters. And that's where the work is, I think, at its, its peak. It's not the same as detecting deception and discerning truth. It doesn't have the same success rate. Um, but overall, uh, if someone were to receive an anonymous threatening letter and we are able to give them a, a profile, for example, a description of what this person is like, male, female, young, old, everything, and we hit only 70% accuracy, it's very likely they're going to know who did it. So it, it's a, a great tool on a more minor stage. What we use it for is to gain insight into a suspect's personality 
for the purpose of the interview. So we're able to, and this is all done in confidentiality, but we're able to give uh, an investigator, for instance, great insight with the person he has to interview or she has to interview before the interview takes place. And that is tremendous, uh, a tremendous tremendous advantage in terms of clearing an innocent person or framing uh, in a certain context what's happened to understand, and that sometimes can clear someone, and then, of course, catching the guilty. So it's, it's difficult. It's challenging work. Um, and they did a tremendous job. But in working with the family, and the family came on one of our sessions as in the team, um, they want to check with them first and what they want uh, in terms of the next steps. And so I know some of you have been waiting for quite some time for this to be released, uh, for their work to be released, but going to hold off until um, we check with the family, what they respond, and, and including any investigators that are still involved. Now, I said something that sounds a bit outrageous um, if you don't know uh, much about analysis, but I said something to the team that was said to me years ago on a missing child case where an investigator said to me, you know more about this case than we do. That's not a testament to me. It's a testament to the work of analysis and being able to uh, have those very free debates among a lot of professionals to get to the point where you really know things. And what I said to the team uh, investigating Ian Bailey, the British journalist that um, was convicted in France, is that they got to know him in a way that I think no one else knows him. His parents are gone, so you can't interview them. He's gone now. They dug under everything. They looked at every minor detail. They got uh, private statements from the family. They had uh, just done tremendous work. And what they did was they presented the work and allowed us to go tear it apart for them. And what was produced by the team, I think, is gold. And so they know him. They know his personality. They understand uh, his discussions about childhood. Um, they looked at the jobs he has held, his poetry, handwriting analysis, just a tremendous amount of work and, and um, working with the family and any uh, investigators to come. They'll figure a way to uh, bring out the information uh, that I think will be uh, rather startling in terms of the insight. Now, Sophie was killed, um, and this is going back to the late 90s, in a most brutal fashion, which, of course, speaks to uh, the profile of what we're looking at. But um, this particular very short statement that I'm pulling up is picture it almost 30 years later. So it not only did we get to know uh, Ian Bailey quite a bit, but we listened to him really over the years uh, through the statements. And one must consider what is it like, presuming he did it, presuming France got it right and, and the uh, Ireland knew, felt they couldn't prosecute for whatever reason, what would it be like 30 years later for him to address it? We still think it's, I didn't kill Sophie. That's the easiest thing to say. The reason I ask you to consider what decades would do to someone like that is because somehow if he did it, and I'm asserting obviously that he did, he would have to survive from, I think it was December 1996. He'd have to survive for almost 30 years with that. Anyone would. We all have to survive. We all have coping mechanisms. 
if we were to receive the full guilt of that crime, we couldn't survive. We have to somehow find a way to minimize it, to rationalize it, to justify it, that sort of thing. And I think the team did a, a fantastic job in getting to those details, in listening to him talk about religion, about women, etc. After so many years, and I'm, and I'm estimating about 30 years, but three decades almost, after that much time, To survive, you would have to do something in the language. We'd see it. And so this is a, a unique um, opportunity to get insight into a mind that has, uh, I believe, lived for these decades with the guilt, the not, or at least the knowledge, perhaps not the guilt, but the knowledge. And it's fascinating to get insight into his language. So I'm going to pull up a, a short statement for you but I think gives insight into where he's at just recently and where he would be at in terms of someone that has had, had to do that very thing, had to do the, the survival, um, the ability to survive. So let's see if this works here. I'm not technologically challenged. I'm technologically uh, a disaster, but... I'm getting there with this. So can everyone see the screen there? Oh, it's coming up. And this was something he said recently. I am very, very sympathetic to them, them being the family. The thing about the family is that they were assured very early on in the investigation that the Irish police knew who had murdered her, and that person was me. So I want to talk about making this statement, making it not shortly after the murder, that we, we have early statements on that, that indicate guilt. And I think that the team showed a personality of one who would do this readily if crossed. This is decades later. This is someone who likes to hear himself talk. This is someone who fancies himself as a poet, as a mini celebrity, um, and has done so probably since childhood from what we're able to grasp from his language. And so he now speaks out regarding Sophie's family who are alive and still wanting justice. And so the question is, is this, that person was me, is that an embedded admission in the language? And what I had asked in the last session, which was uh, in January with the team, was not to rush to any conclusion about that, to explore it. And that was not difficult for them because they had been going so slowly and, and carefully through things um, that it would not... Uh, be out of character just to keep those breaks on and, and keep that open mind and have some healthy debate on this. So let's take a look at what he said, and then I'll give you what was said afterwards. So what we expect here, I'm very, very sympathetic to them. The thing about the family is that they were assured very early on in the investigation that the Irish police knew who had murdered her, and that person was me, which then leads into the perfect time to give a, a denial. I didn't kill Sophie. And there's lots of nuance here, but I want to look at a couple of things uh, and then maybe take a few questions on this. But this is this is basically all I'm going to cover. And I'm looking to answer the analytical question, is this an embedded admission of the murder? So I am very, very sympathetic to them. I will sound somewhat repetitive, and I apologize, but it is necessary do not forget, this is decades later. Decades later. So would you feel sympathetic towards them who have falsely accused you 
And this has gone on for decades. And then saw you convicted in absentia in Paris. Would you be sympathetic to them? Now, most people, if you've been through the hell of a false accusation, I haven't, but people that are, they are angry. They are angry. And the family has not backed away from this all this time. So we're noting here, and I'll, I'll jump here now. Is the sympathy in order to be uh, sympathetic? Yep, sympathetic is the word. In order to be sympathetic with them, it uh, speaks to a, a degree of closeness. When you have sympathy for someone, you have a grasping of their pain and struggles. You have a grasping of or an embracing of what is wrong. Um, it is a word that's used which indicates closeness. And this closeness, which we're accepting, unless he talks us out of it, then becomes very, which is a level of sensitivity, and then very again, two levels of sensitivity attached to this closeness. So the question is, would such persuasion, would such sensitivity need to exist after decades? And it would not. This is a disingenuous sympathy by one who, you know, and it's hard for me to, to divorce myself from what I know about him. This is from someone who likes to persuade people who was very concerned about his reputation, who liked to think of himself as much more than he was, which uh, even that will give you insight into Sophie's death. So we find this sentence, especially in the context that we're looking at it, to be what we call incongruent in statement analysis. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. But thankfully for us, he goes further and we're able to see what is this based upon? What does he base this sympathy for those who were, in essence, his enemy? And was this some form of higher character who... Um, recognizes the difficulty and the beauty and the necessity of forgiveness. And so we have insight into his religious beliefs, and, and it certainly isn't that. And this is why um, when we do a psycholinguistic profile, it has to be encompassing and taking as much information in it as we can, and then seeking to discern it and distill it down to something that we can uh, analyze. So he starts off with, I am very, very sympathetic to them, and I am concerned that he is disingenuous, that he is playing to the audience, that he is looking to manipulate, which is consistent with his character uh, for all of his life. The thing about the family is that they were assured. It's not Sophie's family. And they're not named. But this is which this is what I find so fascinating here is that we now are able to ask, or at least see, that assurance was given to the family. So I am very, very sympathetic to them. And as he goes to explain this, is the family received comfort. The family received assurance. So I'm, I'm now learning from his own words what he bases the sympathy upon. Even though 
by avoiding Sophie's name and avoiding um, their name, their names and he knows, he is distancing himself further. So after almost three decades, very, very is an emotional level that would not be reached by someone that had to survive all these years with the knowledge of what he had done to her. So as this sympathy is being undermined by him, he even tells us the source of the sympathy. The thing about the family, and there's, there's much to unwrap there, but not for today. The thing about the family is they were assured. They were given assurance, which is something that a family would want, a family needs. We're going to, to get the killer. No one else is going to suffer the fate that your beloved Sophie suffered so brutally and so horrifically. But even in doing so, he continues to distance. He's betraying this assertion. He's undermining it here, and he's betraying it here with the distance. And his sympathy is based upon an assurance. And what is the assurance? So the disingenuous sympathy is congruent now with his distancing language. This is being affirmed by his own words for us for as we work in the analysis. We're declaring, hey, your sympathy seems disingenuous. And now we're getting an affirmation or a building block as he continues with distancing language from the family. So don't claim something this close as you run away on either side of it. So they were assured, they received assurance, which is an element of comfort. An element of comfort, assurance. Very early on in the investigation, so what he's signaling here for us, if we're following his words and allowing his words to guide us, is that his memory is engaged from almost three decades ago. And the brutal murder is not something you would forget. And I think his memory is just fine. Very early on, in the investigation that the Irish police knew who had murdered her and that person was me. So now we look at the basis of the assurance. And I, I hope this comes together for you in, uh, in terms of the conclusion. So he has sympathy, that's step one. He tells us about the sympathy, remarking that the family were given assurance, comfort, a certain declination, declination or reducing of the pain of the unknown, among all things that, that, that families of victims experience, is that unknown. And this has been removed from them early on by the Irish police. And so as we look at this as a possible embedded admission, a lot of people get this wrong because um, they don't understand the ascribing of words. It, it has to originate from the person himself. And after nearly three decades, these are the words he chose. Not the police blamed me. Not that they falsely accused me, because there should be distancing from him and the murder. And that's not what's here. When you follow the pronouns, that is not what's here. The disingenuous sympathy is congruent with his distancing language. So I'm able to conclude that.
the Irish police knew who had murdered her and that person was me. He's assigning this not to the words of the Irish police, but this is a dead giveaway here. It's what the Irish police knew. So if I say to you, um, this district attorney thinks I'm a liar, someone will flag and say, I am a liar. See, he just confessed, and that's not it at all. Um, I'm ascribing the words of what uh, someone said. Someone said. I may be suspicious and think that they, they think that of me. Um, and even that's weaker. It's not an embedded admission, but it's, it's weakness. The district attorney said I was a liar. I didn't lie. And so you, you right away that there's no connection between the person and that lie. So they can't join it together. They, they, and when they do, it's ascribed to someone else and it must be rebuked. He doesn't do that. This is the basis of his sympathy. And he's actually given you tremendous insight into the personality, which I am going to say mostly for the team, though. The Irish police said they knew who murdered and the murderer was me. No, it's what they knew. And I ask you to believe him unless he undermines his own words. Believe him. He knows that they knew from the beginning. And he's going back in time quite a bit. He is saying the family receives their assurance that the person who murdered her was me. Now, I'm not interpreting his words. I'm not going outside of his words here. And he has there's many other things here that I don't want to go into right now. And so here's what it ends up concluding. The family receives their assurance. And now I will explain to you, and this is why you see this in the color blue, um, explain to you why I know they receive their assurance. Their assurance is based upon what the police knew. He's not refuting that. And, you know, so the expectation is the police were wrong. I didn't kill Sophie. He should have no reason to uh, avoid her name. How do I know that? Because this is his claim. If I have genuine sympathy for someone, I can say their name. It's not disgusting. I don't need to distance, distance myself from them especially after almost three decades. This is the source of their comfort. They, the police knew that it was me, Ian Bailey, who murdered her. And this is a tremendous insight into his personality. He is so magnanimous. And so above them that he will allow himself, even after all these years, to be called the murderer. You know why? Because it, it allows me to grant them comfort, to grant them assurance. Because I have sympathy for them. And you're looking at a liar. You're looking at a manipulator. Even with all the substance abuse that has likely taken its toll on his brain. He was still manipulating here. He, after all these years, this is an embedded admission of guilt. Now, can that be countered by a reliable denial? Here's what he said afterwards, that he had nothing to do with it. Not that he didn't do it, but he had nothing to do with it an unreliable denial. 
So he, while speaking out with something that he was very, um, very want to do and did often, and I see um, one of the team members is here, uh, Paul. And Paul said, he is mocking the police and the family. And, he's, and Paul's correct. But Paul knows more about this case and, and the other team members here um, than I believe investigators or anyone else on the earth. Even the family. Because the family has been given this information from the team, but being able to explore so much in terms of the documentation. Now, think about this. So this fella is so magnanimous and he is condescending to a low estate to allow them the comfort, allow them to rest assured the murderer is known. And after all those years, there's no denial of the murder. There's no denial of the police knowledge. There's no rebuke of it. And there's phony sympathy. Is your killer. And this is the insight. Um, and, and Paul actually touched upon it there. And what did Sophie meet? What type of beast did she meet that night? He's telling you right here. He's telling you. And he is adding again insult to the original the original injury that was done in the brutal murder so let me see if you have any questions here he has met his maker and um, there's nothing to minimize the judgment but I hope the family is still able to receive some justice. And welcome, Lou. Any questions about this that anyone may have? I, I'm, I apologize for not being able to follow those things before, but I'm trying. So if you have any questions, I want to get to them. Interesting um, in terms of how this unfolded. And Paul, was it 14 or 15 months straight working on this case? Um, we knew from the very beginning it was Ian. That, and that wasn't difficult to discern. But where they took this, the depth and the understanding of this man's character, his childhood, his job, his employment, his treatment of women. Um, they have so much. So we are hoping for the um, some form of justice given to the family. I, I don't pretend to know. Fifteen months, Paul said, and into the family statements as well. Um, I don't pretend to know their their suffering all these years. I know there's some mitigation with time, otherwise we wouldn't survive but I share that this um, very physically brutal murder stemmed from this man's personality, which he did not mind displaying over the last several decades, and it's on display here for others. I just want to make sure I have any of the questions here that uh, you may have. I'm not sure I, I gave enough information that it would um, provoke questions. The, the psycholinguistic profiling, in other words, just profiling from the words, from the analysis of the words. Um, anyone that's really interested, I, I recommend that book, The Secret Wartime Report, The Mind of Adolf Hitler, um, OSS Walter. Langer. It's a really good book to see and, and a, a psychological profile being drawn up of someone from their speeches, from collateral interviews, um, 
our team here has interviews from others. Uh, they've uncovered some things that were a little bit disturbing uh, and some things that were a lot disturbing, but um, even peripheral. That was excellent. So hopefully they'll address that. Thank you for joining me. I, I hope this was useful and um, I'll see you again for another video. Take care.